Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Mike Lukasik. Mike is a managing director and the chief operating officer for the University of Pennsylvania's Office of Investments. Mike has been the COO of Penn's Endowment for over 14 years. And prior to that, he was a VP at Goldman Sachs for the private equity fund of funds business and a VP of finance at Summit Partners. Given his tenure at Penn, Mike brings perspective on the evolution of an endowment office. He talks about how Penn's operations and technology has evolved over time and shares his insights on what is coming down the road. We talk about how to assess what you have versus what you really need, common triggers for change, the future of fund admins and custody banks, and the changing role of investment data. Please enjoy my conversation with Mike Lukasik. Mike, it's great to see you. Nice to see you as well. So 13 years at Penn Endowment, I'd love to hear how you found your way there and dig into all things endowments. I started in public accounting right out of college. And after uh, public accounting, I started basically working in the alternative space. And I've been in the alternative space now 30 years. It's hard to believe. And I think the reason why I ended up at Penn was when I worked at Summit Partners in Boston, I realized, obviously, through all of our LPs being large institutional investors, endowments, foundations, family offices, that I thought at some point in my career, it would be great to be on the other side, so to speak. The opportunity at Penn came up out of the blue. I was working at Goldman Sachs in New York, and the recruiter who had placed me there was asking me if I knew anybody that would be interested in going to work in Philadelphia. And he sent over the job description and I took a look at it and I said, hmm, it was for the Penn Office of Investments. It was a new role. And I said, would they be willing to talk to me? And 13, 14 years later, here I am, I'm still here. <laughs> and what was it like when you first arrived? <laughs> Interesting. So the Penn Office of Investments hasn't been around for a very long time. Actually, it started in the early 2000s. So when I joined, the office was only 15 people. The endowment was only $8 billion, And the asset allocation predominantly at that time was largely equity and hedge funds and fixed income. We really had to get into private equity, real estate, natural resources. That portfolio was just starting to grow. And the operations team was two people. Roberta and Jeff, Jeff, who is still there and still works for me. And Roberta was my director of operations who retired last year after 40 years. Wow. Roberta knew everything. She knew where all the skeletons were in it. So it was a very small shop, absolutely no technology. Everything was done in Excel. Things were saved on shared drives. So it was a challenging environment to walk into, actually having come from other places that had a really big technology environment. The CAO at the time, really didn't have a desire to really build out technology. But a new CIO came on later on during my tenure there, and we've been able to do some great things. What does it look like today? So today, it was 15 when I joined. We are now 32. So we've doubled in size. The endowment has grown to $21 billion. We also took over managing the university's pension assets, which is roughly another almost close to $4 billion as well. The office has changed significantly. Our alternative pool now is grown significantly as well as just part of the natural allocation process. We have roughly 120 active manager relationships. And so when you start going down to the number of line items, it gets exponentially larger pretty fast. Just from a technology standpoint, we definitely have built out our back office environment, actually the entire office environment. So back in 2015, we made the decision to implement Dynamo. It was a multi-phase project. The first part was just setting up our CRM environment for note-taking for the investment team. 
We then moved over documents after that and moved all of our document management into the platform. The last big part was implementing your portfolio management system. Now, Dynamo isn't your traditional GL type system, like an advent or something like that for county purposes, but it allows us to still shadow State Street. As part of our build out of our tech stack, we had an existing relationship with State Street. They were our custodian and administrator, but we weren't utilizing them to the max potential that we could. So we, we worked our relationship with State Street to have them do full books and records, performance, everything. They were inputting wires and so on for us, which then what we did is in Dynamo, we built out a shadowing system to shadow State Street. What we were trying to do in the office is basically allow people to be more analytical and more exception-based versus saying they're king in numbers. Roll it forward even to more recent times. A couple of years ago, we implemented Canoe. So Canoe is a software or AI product that allows us to basically better manage our documents that come into us. It also allows us to scrape those documents for transactions that we can post into Dynamo. And it's really saved us an amazing amount of time. I think we roughly estimated as one and a half FTE. It's just freed up people to do other things and more worthwhile things, quite frankly. And what does your team look like on the op side, if you break that down? We have six people. And the way we can have set it up is I have one person that's more or less, I call them my manager of financial reporting. So they're doing more of the monthly close process and all the day-to-day cash movements and so on. And then I have another person sitting on the same level who basically oversees technology and works with me on operation due diligence. And he has a person that we've started to move over underneath him as well to help out with technology. And that person's also going to be responsible for performance. I think ideally, we still have another headcount that we want to add to the group just to build out the operational component of what we do on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis. But it's worked well. My former director of ops and myself started the roadmap when she announced she was retiring, how we were going to build out the team. Are those individuals hands-on working with groups like Canoe and Dynamo and they're owning that relationship? They are. Yeah. So I would say it's my director. I didn't say director of technology, for lack of a better word. He really oversees the relationship with Dynamo and Canoe for that matter. But we're all involved on the calls on a regular basis. So Dynamo, we talk with them weekly because they have a lot of development that they're working on. It's just a product roadmap. We do give them a lot of input on what we would like to see down the road. And the same with Canoe. Canoe is less frequent. I think Canoe uses us now more as a sounding board for other initiatives that they're looking at. And we will give them our opinion as much as we can. And if it's something that we're really interested in, we may team up with them as well, just from a data perspective. How do you best partner with groups like that who are providing that service to best provide leverage for your own investment operations team? That's a great question. I think that the biggest thing is you have to do a lot of research and just trying to find out who is out there. So for example, for Canoe, we actually had met with them five years ago when they were first starting to build out the product. We actually did a proof of concept with them and we liked what we saw, but we knew they weren't quite ready for prime time and they needed to bake a little longer. And lo and behold, they did. The one risk though is right now what we're seeing is there's a lot of new people coming into this space, especially for allocators, the family offices, the endowments of the world. They're small shops. The question is, can they survive? What we've seen over time, for example, the Solovis, Caesa, which a lot of our peers and a lot of people use, have been swallowed up into other big companies now. And the question is, does the product continue to develop or does it just get lost? Same thing with Dynamo. They're owned by a private equity firm now. What's the ultimate end game? Do they go public or do they get acquired by somebody? What happens to the product? So that's something we think about a lot is who we're going to team up with. And Ultimately, we know maybe five years down the road, we're going to have to make a decision and change and go with something else. It's a big risk right now, quite frankly. And how do you stay on top of who's coming to market just so you pay attention to the things that you may have to make a decision like with Canoe? Five years later, okay, let's keep an eye on that. There's really very few places in one location to find this really narrow stack. Right. And so a lot of it is really just word of mouth. 
And we get a lot of just cold emails coming into us saying, hey, we have this product. So we do take a lot of calls and we do demos to see what products are out there and how they may apply to us. We talk to our peers. I think the one thing that's great about, especially with the Ivy Plus group and some of the other when it's bigger groups that are from all the other smaller schools or outside of the Ivy group is we all talk and we all share our pain points. And if we hear about what someone else is just, hey, we're using Bipsite to do our CRM and we're like, hey, we're looking at Dynamo and hey, we've implemented Copilot to start thinking about AI. So it's just a lot of conversations between the groups. And then just internally, we also have 120 managers. So I have 120 basically CTOs that I can call. We were recently out in California just doing some operation due diligence business. And we had an amazing amount of information on AI from several managers and one product in particular that I think we're going to hopefully explore a little bit deeper. It's an AI tool and see ultimately as we start working on our technology stack for the future, could we actually implement it? So you're doing ODD yourself? Yes. What does an ideal partnership work from an ODD perspective? Because one, you're assessing, but also if you select managers who are excellent in the stack, there's a two-way exchange of what I would call the best form of free consulting. The best part of my job, which I enjoy the most, is going out and seeing our managers. Our approach is also a little bit different, I would say, from an ODD perspective. We partner with great investment firms. Most of them have built out great back office And those who are just trying to get into the space, we spend a lot of time with them, giving them guidance on what makes sense from a back office perspective and making sure that they build it out right from the get-go, but using them as a resource. And it's a two-way street. So we have 120 managers. We know who's using who for compliance, for technology, cybersecurity, law firms, prime brokerage relationships. We have all this data that we maintain in Dynamo that we can share with our managers. So when we're out there and they're like, hey, what compliance systems are you seeing people use? We're like, we can easily pull it up and say, yeah, these are the top five that we see our managers using in your space. What administrators are you seeing? Who is gaining the most traction these days? We can say, okay, in the venture space, these are the three that we're seeing are most common. So it's great. And I think our managers appreciate that if they can pick up the phone and call us and we do make ourselves available. We will also make ourselves available, for example, if a manager is building out their back office or they're looking to hire a CFO or COO, we're more than happy to interview them for them as part of the last step in the process, just to give our opinion and let them know what we think of the candidate. So I've done that multiple times for managers as well. It is developing a relationship with them. And that's what this business is about. We're allocators and it's getting to know the people who are ultimately driving decisions as well as providing you your naps, quite frankly. Are you guys recording that information in one location to know that who uses for hedge funds, use for PBs, fund admins, CTOs, compliance organizations? Through Dynamo, what we do as well is we actually survey all of our managers on an annual basis just to get a lay of the land from an operational perspective, as well as collect some specific data related to say, for example, if we want to talk, ask people about ESG policies or practices, diversity. And we also collect uh, fee information as well on an annual basis. So all of that information is stored in Dynamo and it's easily accessible. Yeah. And on ESG, how are you guys tackling that particular issue today? I think for our office, it's a two-pronged approach. All of our managers, for the most part, have ESG policies in place. What's important to us right now is two things related to the ESG. And one is we have a, a carbon zero pledge for 2050. That's a heavy lift right now for our office. And we're starting to build out how we're going to track that information, where that information should sit. That there's a group specifically in our office working on that and having ongoing conversations with our managers on how they're going to be able to get us this information. It's going to be a huge undertaking for the industry. People know that they're getting more questions from institutional investors on it. The other thing that we did quite a bit of work on the past couple of years is actually DEI and looking at our firms and what managers are doing. The asset management industry has a problem, quite frankly, to attracting a diverse group of people. Our initial couple of surveys clearly pointed that picture out. 
And we've been having ongoing conversations with managers, what initiatives are they undertaking as well to broaden their funnel of candidates come into their entities. We're doing that ourselves internally in our office. We have some specific initiatives that we do um, trying to attract students at Penn who don't have any knowledge of the asset management industry. How do they get involved? We do internships. We have seminars that they can join into. So we're trying to really broaden that pool because we think it's a grassroots effort. It has to actually start at the college and even at the high school level to get kids involved in this industry that they would never have heard about. I mean, me being a first generation college person, the asset management industry, a hedge fund. I remember when I told my parents what I was doing and I worked in Bermuda offshore for five years and I was working for a hedge fund there. And my mother and father were like, what's a hedge fund? What do you do? I tried to explain how a hedge fund works. But it's interesting to have that conversation with them. Roll forward to my next job. I was at a private equity firm. My parents were like, what is private equity? <laughs> and these are very niche industries. And so if you're not in it, you're never going to hear about it. You may hear little things here and there. The managers now, we're seeing them actually get out there more too and really talk about what they do and get college people involved and really starting to understand the industry. Yeah. I mean, there's that opportunity, like you'll probably walk by that door many times if you don't know what's there. It's like, oh, that's a private equity or a hedge fund or whatever. But if you don't know what that is, you're just going to keep going because nobody's told you anything different. Yeah. I mean, my first private equity experience was when I was working for Marsh McLennan in Bermuda. Marsh McLennan was Capital Corp, which was a group based in Greenwich, started private equity funds to invest in Lloyd syndicates and insurance company technology, as well as they did a buyout of travelers at the time. And I had never known what private equity was at that time, quite frankly. And it was something new to me. And I was basically the controller for the funds. And so it was an interesting time. And then starting to deal with LPs who I actually, when I went to work for Summit, I was dealing with some of the same people I dealt with when I was in Bermuda. So it's a very small world of everybody knows everybody in this space. Maybe back to your initiatives on the DEI side, at what point will we get to looking at something and saying, look, you manager, we love you, but you're so behind on reality. We're not going to allocate to you. I think there will be allocators who will have to actually make that choice just based on their mission and their standards. This is not something that is going to turn on a dime. It is going to be five, 10 years before we really start to see movements. On the operational side, there's more diversity, clearly. On the investment side, there's less. So that's really where we need to start seeing more of the movement on that side. And we've done two surveys to date. We're going to hold off now and not do another one for another five years because it's not going to be something you're going to see year over year changing that quick. It's really hard. So it's going to take time. You talked a little bit about the initiatives and the internships. And so if you're a college student, any suggestions on how to get exposure to this side of the investing landscape? I'm actually the contact for our office for inbound resumes. So I get a ton coming from various college students because I think there is a lot of awareness on campuses. A lot of the endowment offices actually recruit on campus just like we do. We have information sessions on campus. We go out there. We have, we're also teaching classes on campus as well. So Peter, like our CIO, will guest speak on endowment allocation or something like that. So we're getting ourselves out there. And I think that's how we'll connect with the college students. But the college students also have to, through their classes, be exposed to it by their professors and their career guidance and looking at these industries. But I think the more we get out there and the more we make ourselves part of the community of Penn or any other university or foundation or once you get your name out there, people will find you. And I think it's happening more and more now. Let's turn to the future. There's a lot of your peers who are trying to figure out where the puck is going on the next phase of the endowment. How do you assess where you are and maybe what you have and what you need? And what's that tipping point where you're like, you know what, this isn't going to work for us anymore? Yeah, that's endowment 2.0. That's what I refer to it as. I think what's happening is especially in the world of data. Since I've joined the endowment office, the volume of information that comes into us is quadrupled. The question is, what do we do with all this information? How do we capture all this information? And I think right now for our office, that's a big inflection point. We've been collecting that data for a long time. Some of it is being extracted and saved, especially like underlying holdings. 
The problem that we're seeing is how do we pull it all together, especially when it's a diverse asset base, real estate, natural resources, hedge funds, global equity, private equity, venture capital. So trying to pull all that information together to actually look holistically at it is what our challenge is right now. And I think when I talk to a lot of my peers, we're all going down that road. And even ironically, talking with our managers, our managers are going through the same thing as well. People are looking at data warehousing, looking at systems, tools to scrape data, pull data in from other data sets and being able to populate that and then easily massage it either through like Power BI or building out views for people to see different ways to see their data. So that's what we're focusing on right now. I think looking back at 2015, we did this big shift to get data into a system. But I think in my perspective, we needed to actually create more ownership of that data with the investment team. And I don't think we did a great job at that. And I think that's what we're starting to realize now is that there needs to be a little bit more ownership on the investment team side because the investment team wants all this data as well. But at the same time, they don't want to own it. And I think we need to gap that bridge between what the operations does and what the investment team does, who owns the data, and then also just making sure the data is coming in the way we expect it to come in. People are reviewing it on a regular basis. Those are all the things we're assessing right now. We've been working just interviewing everyone in the office. We've been talking with our peers. We're doing, once again, lots of calls with vendors to understand what's out there right now and assess it. We're also trying to figure out what do we need from a staffing perspective? Is it internal? Is it external? Do we need a chief technology officer? Do we need a data scientist? Should it be an operations? Should it be a separate group? So these are all the things that we're sitting down right now going through. And I think once we get through this process, it's really going to help us just build the roadmap. And this is not an overnight thing. I think there's some low-hanging fruit that we've already identified that things we can definitely do now. And then I think it will be a multi-year build out just to get data in the right places. Then the question is, how do you pull it all together? And then the big topic now is AI. Can you layer AI over that to start asking questions and looking at your data sets and tell me about this manager? These are all the things that is happening now. How have the needs of the investment team changed on this topic? Yeah, as our number of managers grew and the number of investments has grown as well, in trying to understand performance and trying to understand what's going on behind the scenes, before it would be, I think you made the investment, you go to the annual meeting, you have conversations with the manager, you put notes in the system, and maybe that was it. But now it's really trying to understand is, okay, how have managers' decisions, how have they evolved how the portfolio has evolved, looking also at entry points to when managers, how they make decisions. And the team now just wants to have more of that deeper understanding of our managers, where I think before it was more at a surface level. And I think they really want to get behind the scenes, which is hard because it's different being an allocator. It's a different world. It is a different set of data. But what we're trying to do is really understand what's driving managers' decisions as best we can. And to go have those conversations with managers and be prepared when we go into meetings. A lot of that is really like having that data to be able to discuss with your manager. And, and you can say, well, no, we ran our own analysis. This is what we're seeing. So that's what I think what we're trying to evolve to. I think there's just so much friction in that data handoff. So the LPs are demanding more data from the GPs, but we, you're still handed a piece of paper do you think we'll ever get to a point where somebody's going to crack the code on the PDF and we're going to have something that you can just log in and, okay, this is my holding. I'm going to grab that data. It's not going to be like hand keying in because it's not on a PDF. When I was in private equity back in the days, I started at Summit in 1999 and left in 2007. That was working in the back office. That was our nirvana, was to be able to have investors go into a portal and be able to access the data that they needed. Investment portfolio data, specifically like revenue, EBITDA, and things like that. There were plays in the market starting to move that way. But then I think FOIA came along and that really started making investors scared as to what data they have in their own offices. I don't think people wanted people knowing exactly what was in their portfolios at a deep level because they were afraid it was going to get shared with somebody else. But ideally, that's what you really would want. You'd want to be able to just be able to go in and pick your data and download it right into your system. I don't know if we're ever going to get there. I think there are some people working to scrape things better and build that database for you. 
But a lot of it too is the data is stale, quite frankly, because you can't get stuff real time. For example, a private equity fund, we're just getting December financials and now it's March 31st. We're always going to be stale. Real time is going to be really hard to do. But I think the more LPs request the information to the GPs, the GPs are going to have to listen. Whether they do is up to them. Yeah. Even on the PE lag, I mean, there hasn't been any movement in the delivery of that. And we're at this interesting point of, if you look at other sectors and industries who can deliver things that are way more complicated and more timely, why can't we just value a company and tell you what it is and not have to wait a quarter? <laughs> well, I think what's also happening too is some of the new SEC rules are really going to have to speed up things as well because the requirements for deadlines are just going to be a little bit tighter now. So maybe there will be some benefit from the SEC rules that are coming out on private funds that will have benefits down the road, but it's yet to be seen. So ideally, we love to get something within 30 days. Yeah. Versus... 45 days or 60 days, which is standard in that year end, it can be 90 or longer to get information in. Does your board investment committee at the board level, are they just recipient of that information or do they care? That's interesting. So we meet with our board on a quarterly basis and we have a very prescribed board book, what we provide to them. So our board meetings are generally topical. So we'll decide what we think we'd like to present to them. So it could be a deep dive on a specific asset class. It could be about China. It could be about AI. So that's typically like our agenda. And then we talk about performance, obviously, and asset class allocation once a year needs to be approved by them. But And then we also give them a big, it's called the arts our appendix, which is just all the data of what's happening. So our board really concerned about, are you getting a statement in 45 days or 90 days. Now they're not, but most of them are on the asset management industry to begin with. So they know the pain points that we have. Back to the other question about who do you partner with? Do you buy or build predominantly? That's a big choice that you have to make. And we're thinking about that right now. I think it's hard to build personally because you need to have the resources internally to be able to maintain whatever you build. I was talking with some of our peers and they have 20, 30 people dedicated to IT and development. It's just like, we don't have that. Same thing for some of our managers. They have big IT departments. I think what we've also seen over time too is just the trend in the industry. Obviously, State Street is our custodian and administrator. We've seen them take the more the model of buy versus build themselves as well. But as I mentioned earlier, we're also seeing where some of these small companies that come into the space are being acquired by some of these bigger players as well, because they don't want to build it. And it's, hey, they have a great tool. We'll just buy it and then leverage that. I think really the decision there has to come down to your office or your particular environment and what makes the most sense. And then what about where do you see the role of admins, custodian banks and playing a role in that space for the future? I think it's how you use those service providers. We were at a meeting last week with some peers that use State Street. It was endowments, pension, and family offices and foundations. Everybody uses their providers differently. So we shadow. Some people don't shadow. They'll rely 100% on their administrator or custodian. And then others will do it themselves and just use the custodian for a true custodian or prime broker just for that purpose of holding assets. I think at the end of the day is we see State Street like as a second back office to us. I think that's what we're seeing now, quite honestly, even on the our hedge fund managers or private equity managers. The fund admins are really just this outsourced back office is what it comes down to. I think over time, that relationship you have with them is really important because they are part of your team. You're paying them a different way. You're paying them through fees versus them sitting in your office. We look at State Street the same way. We know there's hundreds and hundreds of people behind doing the stuff that we need to get done to get wires out the door, distributions process, performance calculated. So I think over time, we could completely go outsourced if we wanted to 100%. And then we would just be reviewers and consumer and consume the data that comes in from them. But I think we found that we feel that there is a benefit of really knowing your data really well. I think it just gives you an extra level of just comfort that you're checking things and comparing what someone else is doing. 
And that's what most of our managers do as well. Most of them shadow their administrator or whoever. So I think there's some value there, but I think it's going to evolve over time because the systems are getting better. The access that you can basically log into what the administrator is doing and see it and pull the data yourself, you can do it. I know some of my peers have definitely moved to that model and it works. Is the custodian, are they moving toward more of an IBOR? That's a good point. The IBOR versus ABOR, which is always a lengthy discussion in all of our office. The systems now are getting much better. And that's something we're working with Dynamo right now is to build a better IBOR, ABOR for our investment team. Our investment team, look, they want IBOR and we want operations team. There's ABOR. So you got two battles going on. I think the systems that are being built are out there today. Just They give you that flexibility to be able to say, I need accounting book or record and I need my investment book or record. So I think the systems have really moved that way. Quite frankly, at the administrators, the custodians, everyone can do it now. How do you think about the impact on who you hire? And there's just a lot going on for a firm like yours. What's the ideal hire for somebody like Penn? Yeah. So from an operations perspective, my newer team members have all come out of the administrator space or have worked at other asset management firms. So it's people who are in the back office roles that are doing what we do on a day-to-day basis. Maybe it's a different scale. My director of financial reporting that I just hired to replace my director of operations, he came to us from SEI. And one of his largest clients was a big sovereign wealth fund. So has that experience of a multi-class, large transactions and volumes of information. I think those are the resources that you're going to need. I also think probably over time too, we need people who have experience in programming. Power BI has become the big tool and it's definitely worthwhile for people to have that experience. But once again, I think we need to pull people who come from the asset management industry and into the endowments because it's that's the world we're in. And I think the way we're set up and how our compensation is and so on is more like an asset manager versus what I would say an academic institution. And when you bring those people in, is there any habits they need to shed (laughs) in order to adopt to your environment coming from the service side? It's just really coming in and understanding how we do things. I think it's really all it is. They've been preparing financial statements. They've been preparing NAVs. They've worked on Advent. They've worked on various systems. So I really don't think it's really of a reprogramming. I think it's just getting used to our processes and procedures internally. And I actually think people that we bring in from the outside, it's pretty natural for them. What I find interesting is when we hire new investment analysts, which are just first time recent grads from Penn coming into more of an investment office environment where we act like we're a registered investment advisor. So we have compliance policies and we have trading rules and quarterly sign off. The people that come in from the outside, everyone's like, yeah, I've been doing this my whole life versus the people that we bring in that are new. It's a whole new world to them. So there's a lot more training involved with that. You had hinted earlier about AI. I'd love to turn to that and get your sense of where the market is, what you guys are thinking about, what your peer group's thinking about there. It's two things. One, we know we need to start now because if we think, we feel like if you don't start now, you're going to be playing catch up. So we're definitely looking at what tools can we use in our office. So we're working right now on one thing is with Dynamo. So Dynamo is their provider. So they're looking at Microsoft's Copilot as potentially layering that into the product. And that would just help with summarizing. Say, for example, you receive a manager's quarterly letter. It could produce a summary easily for the investment team. It also could take notes in our system and summarize it as well. And I think that's a step. Those are, I would say, the simple things to do. Canoe is AI. Canoe is an AI tool that learns as you receive information in. It looks and it can pull data automatically without you having to, and it learns as you tell it, no, you need to go here, and it will actually learn going forward. There's a lot of tools out there in other new companies starting up that we've heard about through managers that have some really interesting products. We were at a private equity manager out on Sand Hill Road, and they were using this product actually during our meeting to give us DEI stats and ask certain questions. And it was pretty impressive. So I think that's a company that we may follow up with and see what they're doing. They're doing more stuff, more for service providers. It's more the customer interface and asking the little would you like to chat with somebody? That's, I think, where we are right now. And we're trying to say, how can we apply those tools to us? But what we think is, if we want to apply these tools, they have to be able to access our entire data set. So it's like, do you build a data warehouse to move things to and then layer the AI on top of that to be able to go down? And then 
there's compliance issues with AI. We want to be able to segregate things because, for example, look, I, I do stuff related to payroll and things like that. I don't want somebody going in, typing in, how much does Mike make and being able to access that information in my environment. There's compliance things you have to think about at the end of the day. So I think it's baby steps. We're talking with our peers. Our peers are all starting to do the same thing. And it's just a matter of time before we're using it more and more on a day-to-day basis. I think at the end of the day too is what we would love it to do is, especially at the overall level from the investment standpoint is say, hey, we're going to go visit XYZ manager. What things should we talk to them about and have it go through all of the notes you've been taking and the documents you receive and looking at performance and have it recommend topics. I think that would be really cool if we can get to that level. Some other areas that we've been working on too with AI is legal document reviews. Our general counsel that sits in our office has been looking at some new tools to just help with that process, like looking at terms and being able to go through documents relatively quick to see these are the key things, here's what you should look at. Nothing's ready for prime time yet. I think we see the tools there. There's some great things happening and someone may break it. Someone may finally figure out, build the better mousetrap that does it. It's just going to take time. And then we're also having conversations with managers. Some of our managers are hiring data science groups. They're hiring people to build technology that allows them, say, to go through a bond offering or a bankruptcy default, go through that data and give me the key things I need to know. And does this make sense? It's a quick summary for them. So a lot of it is summarizing information. Is it actually going to make decisions for us to be continued? This has been really fascinating, Mike. I want to close with two questions. One is, what advice would you give to an emerging manager? It's a great one. And we've actually been dealing with this with a couple recently. And it's really making sure, especially from my perspective, look, the investment team is the investment team. But you have to really focus on your back office functions. And I've seen this in my own personal career. When I was at Summit and joined there, basically the firm had grown really fast and the back office functions haven't kept up. And you're playing catch up. Don't play catch up. Just set it up right from the the get-go. Get the right tools. Get the right people. Make the investment. Yeah, it's going to cost you. But in the long run, it's worth it because one nav screw up or something like that, and you're having to explain to your LPs that something is wrong, is not going to be a very pleasant conversation for the manager. So spend the time, get it right, avoid compliance issues, avoid regulatory issues. They have to do this now. You can't just run it like a shoebox anymore. And then the other question I have is what one industry resource could be book, could be article, blog post, anything you recommend to others to read? I think for managers, especially when they're saying, well, how can we document things better and how can we do things better? Honestly, I do point them to the AIMA and their wealth of resources they have there. We're a member of it. I do provide our managers just like, here's how to think about documenting your back office functions. We all go to manager meetings and we're looking for checklists and we're looking for things like that. And it's just like to build it now and build it right. And they have some great tools. It's definitely worthwhile to do that. I mean, there's ILPA. ILPA is the same thing as... Adopt the ILPA formatting right away, and you'll save yourself a ton of time and questions later on because, especially if you're a new manager, you bring in 20, 30 LPs, somebody needs to deal with those 20, 30 LPs on a regular basis. And to the extent that you can provide really good information, and of course, there's rules with the SEC and other jurisdictions as well as what you can provide, but to the extent that you can commoditize it and give people what exactly they need, it's going to save you a ton of time because if you start doing a la carte reporting or anything like that, it's just going to be a disaster for you. So really try to make them all the resources that help them streamline their processes themselves. All right, Mike, thanks for the time and appreciate all your insights. No, this is great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.